Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. He said, I don't want you to not understand or not be aware. See, ignorance isn't stupidity. That's not what ignorance means. Ignorant means I just don't know that I don't know. I, I have never been told... I have never been shown, and I don't know that that exists. So it's not that we're dumb. It, that's not it. It's not that we're novice or inexperienced. It's just there are things in the Spirit that the Apostle Paul, speaking to the Corinthian church, said, I don't want you to be ignorant or, or not knowing about these things. And so some of the stuff that we will talk about, you know. Some of the stuff that, you, that we'll talk about, you don't know. And so uh, I want to bring that to you tonight. Lord, I ask you in the power of the Holy Ghost that you would speak to us in the power of the Spirit, God. I pray, O oh God, tonight that your Spirit would rest upon us, that we would hear from you, that we would hear God in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, and understand, God, things that are so far beyond us, O oh God. Help us, I pray, God, tonight. Open our minds and our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There, this is part one, and you know, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat tonight, I'm just going to speak in very general terms about some very general things before we get into specifics in the coming um, messages. There is a spirit world. That is the first thing that you have to come to terms with and that you have to understand is that there is a spirit world. Now, we live in the physical world. We use our, our senses in the, in the physical world. We, we hear certain sounds. If you have the gift of hearing, you, you can hear certain, certain sounds. Um, and so you, you, can, you, you hear traffic, you hear music, you hear noise. We hear, we hear things all day long. It's a part of our life. We smell things. Just the other night, uh, I'm in bed and I'm sound asleep. And my wife comes barging in the bedroom, honey, get up, I smell something. And she thought we had a, 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 a gas leak in our, in our laundry room. And we don't really know exactly what it was. It had a bit of a gas smell, but it could have been, we have a drain there and the sump could have got a little bit dry and burped up some, some gas into the house or whatever. But at any rate, she smelled something. So our nose, is constantly in use all the time. It is constantly in use. Now, I work with a guy that has no sense of smell whatsoever. He cannot smell. He was in an auto accident, and it took away his sense of smell. So, so we, we do use the nose constantly. We, we use our eyes. If you have the gift of sight, thank God for the ability to see we use our eyes and we, we, take, in, we take in visual stimulus. We, we're always looking at things and always measuring, seeing, uh, judging what we see. We're, we're constantly using our eyes. And we have taste. And, and I'm grateful. I'm very thankful for taste. Um, sometimes I wish I will, when I get to heaven, and I say this now, but when I actually get to heaven, I don't know that I actually do this. But I would like to ask God this question. Why, why cannot broccoli be the thing that I have to abstain from and I have to quit eating broccoli and now I, gotta, I have to eat donuts now. I just, that's what I'm left with is donuts because broccoli's bad for me or, or, or uh, tofu and all these other things. Man, you just can't, you shouldn't eat that. That's just bad for you. You need to eat french fries. So... I, I don't know why the Lord made it that way, that you got to stop eating French fries and donuts, and you got to start eating all this other... I, I don't know. I just wish it was the other way. I just really do. But of course, being humans like we are, we'd say, oh, I hate these donuts. I want me some broccoli. That's just the way we are. We always want what we can't have. 
So, <laughs> hope I didn't lose you on that. But that's just human nature. We want what we don't. What, that's a whole nother message. <laughs> I really wish it was that way. So we have touch. We, we feel things. We, we know what hot is. We know when we walk out that door, we know what cold is. So, I mean, we touch, we feel, we have sensory in, in that area. Um, but these are the normal senses that we use in this world, and they're very necessary. Um, we need these senses to be able to operate, to be able to live, to be able to function in the world that we, we live in. They're meant for our safety. They're meant for our security. Now, if you lose one of those senses, you know, the guy that I work with that has no sense of smell, that's very dangerous where I work. If he's walking by a pump and the pump is starting to go bad, one of the first signs is a smell. You're going to smell a burnt smell. If he's walking around the unit and a, a product is leaking, it, the first sense that you have that the product is leaking, leaking is your smell. It, it actually gets to your taste. You can taste it after if it's at a certain level, but the first thing you notice is that smell. So you, you need smell. You need sight. You need hearing. You need touch. You, you need taste to be able to function properly in the world that we live in. But there is an entirely different world, a second world that is just as real as the world that we live in here. It's just as real as, as the physical things that I see you and you see me. That it's just as real. It is the spiritual world. And the spiritual world is just as real as the physical world. Now, I see Amanda, I see Rachel, I see my wife, I see Amy, I see Krista, I see all of you. But what I don't see are the angels that are in this house. Now, now the physical I can see. But I cannot see the spiritual. But there are the angels that are in this house are just as real as you and I that are here today. They're just as real. I, and I wish I could see the angels, but I, I cannot see them. Mitchell said he saw them and fell over the speaker <laughs> while he was pray in prayer one night. But the, the angels are just as active. They're just as real in, in, in this world. But they're a different world that we are not accustomed to. But the spiritual world is active around us all the time. The spiritual world is constantly moving around us all the time. And we actually live in both worlds. We, we, we only can sense with these senses that we have in this world, but there, there are spiritual senses that we have. Our senses do us no good in, in the spirit world. We cannot see, we cannot hear, we cannot touch, we cannot taste, we cannot smell the spirit world. You cannot do that. You, you, you don't have the ability with your physical eyes to sense that. Now, with that said, we can feel the spirit of God move when he moves. But what I'm trying to make you understand is that you are constantly in the presence of God but you do not always feel him. Mm -hmm. You are constantly around angels, but you don't always see them. Always and so the, the physical senses that we have really don't do us any good when it comes to the spiritual. Mm -hmm. We must rely on a totally different sense in order to participate in the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. We have spiritual senses that can contact the spiritual world. Our spirit, your spirit and my spirit, is made to contact the spirit of God. Right. It's made to do that. That's what it is meant to do. It's meant to interact with the, the presence of God. It's made to be in a relationship, in a place where you can sense and feel and come in contact with the presence of God. It's actually a command of Jesus that we do that. In John chapter 4 and verse 24, Jesus makes a statement concerning worship. He said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, not should, not have the ability to. 
not is recommended to, but he says you must worship him in how? In spirit and in truth. So the the word of God, Jesus speaking to us, lets us know that it is a command. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's the desire that God of God that we worship him in spirit and so God wants to interact with you and I on a spiritual level and it is so much deeper than any physical level that you'll ever experience God wants to interact with you God wants to interact with every one of us it doesn't matter your age when brother Arnold was here and and uh, brother uh, Martinez was in the back with the children Mitchell, you went back there. Was the power of God moving back there? We had, what, six kids get the Holy Ghost? I mean, it doesn't matter your age. You are created to interact with the presence of God. So so God made us with that ability. We have to understand that that is normal in the church. I I have been trying to drive this. What is normal and what is abnormal. It is normal for the church of God to be in interaction with the spiritual world. It's normal. It's very normal. Both with that of heaven and that of hell. It's very normal. It's, it, and, and when I'm talking about, I'm saying that we must be interacting with the power and presence of God in our relationship and our love towards Him. But we must be interacting with hell as well as we come against the forces of hell. That we acknowledge that there are spirits that are trying to destroy you and I and our family and our friends. That it is, it is bent on dragging the people of the city of Soldatna and our loved ones to hell. And we must realize that, we must recognize that, and we must come to grips with the fact that we must be the intermediary between hell heaven and hell for those people because that's what we're called to do God did not give the gospel to the angels to preach he gave it to man he gave us he told you and I that we are the body of Christ as the body of Christ we are the ones that will go out reach and teach we are the intermediaries we are the ones to go and do And so that's normal. Spiritual activity is something that we should regularly have in the church. Because God desires this activity, He will be promoting this activity in the church. There will be an unctioning in the spirit of every person that has any sort of spiritual desire within them. There will be an unctioning in that person's spirit. Every church has to have the gifts of the Spirit in operation in order to be healthy. Did you hear me on that? The gifts of the Spirit have to be in operation in a church for that church to be healthy. If the gifts of the Spirit are not operating in that church, then the church is not healthy. God set them there for a reason, and they are to be used. God desires to interact with His people. God wants to move through His people. God desires to speak to us and to strengthen the church. And it is His body and it is through His Spirit and truth that we are fed. That's how it happens. We rely heavily on the truth in preaching. We are very good about ensuring that we preach the truth, that doctrine is correct, that people are indoctrinated, that people receive the the Word of God. We understand the purpose and the need of preaching. And we're very good and we're very strong in, in, in making sure that that happened. But the purpose and the power and the necessity of the Spirit are just as great. It's just as great a need to have not just truth, but spirit. It's just as important that the Spirit of God move. We are incomplete without the operation of the gifts. We have only half of the equation. 
We do not have the fullness of the operation that feeds the church. If the church is going to grow, it takes the gifts of the Spirit. We, we, we're going to preach. We're going to teach. We all believe that. You can go to any United Pentecostal church, and you're going to hear the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. But where we fall short is in the use and in the propagation of the gifts of the Spirit. We must have them. We must have them. We have got to have them. Something down there that keeps wobbling my pulpit. <clears throat> and so he gives what we call gifts for that interaction. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Paul said that, that it is not good to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. It's not good. It's important to be in operation of these gifts, and we should understand as much as possible uh, about them. Corinth was working in the gifts. The church of Corinth was working in the gifts. They had prophecy at work in the church. They had tongues at work in the church. They had interpretation. They had all of the gifts that were working in the church. And Paul wrote to the Corinthian church not to tell them that spiritual gifts existed, um, or not to tell them how they existed, but to, to direct them in the use of the, of the gifts. It wasn't that Paul was saying, I want to let you know about spiritual gifts. They knew about them. But Paul said, I need to give you direction in the use and in the operation of the gifts. The church was operating in them, but they were operating in a wrong manner. The use of the, of the gifts of the Spirit were, were out of order, and they were incorrect. And so Paul wrote to correct to this church their misuse and their misunderstanding because it was twofold for them they misunderstood them and because they misunderstood them they misused them right, right. there is a right way and there is a wrong way to operate in the gifts of the spirit okay i, I want you to understand that in the very beginning of this there is a right way and there is a wrong way so so i these this thing i want you to understand it's normal it should be done it's healthy it's right. right. But there is a wrong way and a right way. Mm -hmm. There is. Mm -hmm. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17, he said, Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty bad. Their coming together was something that when they walked away from church, they were worse off than when they walked through the door. That's not okay. That's, that's, not okay. that's not how church is supposed to be. That when you walk in the door and you get done with church, you walk out worse than you came in. That, that is not what church is about, my friend. That is not what it is meant to be. Now, some people walk out of the church and they're more upset than when they came in, but that's only because something pricked their heart. If, if it's done right, if it's in the right, now they could walk into the church and somebody walk up to them and say something very mean about them and they could walk out because uh, that's, not, that's not a church that's doing things right. That's not doing it right. But if God speaks to us and we get upset over that, which I have done before myself, then... That's right. That's right. Not for me to get upset, but just that God spoke to me. Okay? So, for this church, their coming together created more trouble for them than when they left. I didn't say that right. They were worse off leaving than when they came. That's what Paul said. That is the importance of ensuring that the operations of the gifts are done properly and according to Scripture. So 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Paul is speaking concerning gifts again. He says, now there are diversities of the gifts, but the same Spirit. 
and there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh in all, or all in all. You see, everything is done by the Spirit of God. We have to understand that. There is nothing that is done in spiritual gifts that is done by your will or my will. Nothing done by the will of man. It is done by the power of God. God is the director. God is the conductor. God is the controller of everything that happens in the Spirit. You have to understand that. I don't just decide that I want to say something and get up in front of everybody and say, thus saith the Lord. I don't just begin to speak in a, a, a blabberish gibberish and say that I have a word of tongues. For I, You don't do that, my friend. It, it's not done that way. You don't, you don't go in that manner. That is not what the Bible says. He said that there are diversities of the Spirit, but the same Spirit. He says, and there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, God, which worketh in all. So it's God that is working it. It's God that's controlling it. It's God that is doing it. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Now you're just going to have to stay in 1 Corinthians. I'm either going to be in 12 or 14. So just if you got your Bibles and you're flipping back and forth, just stick little stickers in there. And so for the next few weeks, we're just going to be flipping back around in there. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So every church, every church, God is not going to bring in confusion. No, no, no. But he's going to bring in peace. Isn't that what it said? He's not the author of confusion, but of peace. So every church will not be in confusion, but every church will be in peace. God desires conformity and consistency. It isn't done differently in this church than in another church. You go, I, and, and I'm telling you the honest truth, I have been in churches where there has been a word of prophecy, a word of tongue, interpretation, and every time, without fail, no matter where, I, because of the times, passing the mantle, this church, Kenai, wherever I've gone, it's always happened the exact same way, mm -hmm. without fail. Yes. It has. I'm not making that up. That's just the way God does it. Mm -hmm. God does not work in confusion and chaos. No, he does not. What is done in the Spirit is to be done in a way that brings order and edification. That's what the Spirit of God does. So, what is is the purpose what is the purpose of the gifts we know that there are gifts they're done uh, in order that that that's normal in the church that but why would god say i want not through your touch not through your smell not through your taste you, you can't you can't work that way but i'm going to work a different way this is going to be through the spirit why would God do that? What's the purpose of God wanting to do that? Right. Well, there is a purpose for that. Mm -hmm. So it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 12. It says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel. Okay? Seek that you get, you get good at this. You're, you're working well at this. Why? To the edifying of the church. You want to, you want to work in the Spirit? You, you want the spiritual gifts in operation? Great. But they are for the edifying of the church. Right. The gifts of the Spirit are meant to grow the church and to make it stronger. Edify. Well, what does edify mean? The Greek here? Now, I'm not teaching anything that most of you don't already know. But the Greek for edify is the act of one who promotes another's growth in, the, in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, holiness. 
promotes another's growth. So edification is helping to promote growth. Merriam-Webster says this about edifying. The Greek says it. Well, let's see what Merriam-Webster has to say. It means to teach someone in a way that improves the mind or character to build or to establish. That's edifying. And, and Jesus said that the gifts are given to the church to edify the church. What, what does that mean? It means it's meant to make you stronger, to build you up, to give you wisdom and knowledge, and to make you a, a greater, stronger Christian. That's, that's what it's meant for. That's, that's what edification is for. So God gave us gifts of the Spirit that the church would be built up, improved, and made better. It's the edification of the individual as well. Okay? So it's a two-part. It's edification of the individual, and it's an edification of the church. The edification of the individual. You personally are meant to grow and become stronger in your faith. Every one of us. From, from all, of, all, all of my girls and my wife to uh, each and every one of you, every one of us, Charlie and, and uh, Ariel, we're all meant to grow. Right, right. We are all meant to grow, personally grow. Spiritual gifts are meant to improve and make better and your life and to build a stronger relationship with God. Spiritual gifts are meant to make you stronger in working within the realm of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts are meant to make you stronger in prayer, make you stronger in faith, right. more effective in the Spirit and in the workings of the Spirit. So that when you pray, the Bible says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay, great. We understand that. But what you have to understand is those that are working in the gifts of the Spirit, those that have, have deepened their relationship and grown in that, are very effective in the Spirit. Why are the prayers of some more effective than the prayers of others? Now, it just it happens that way. Because there are those that are constant in prayer and have, have, have understood how to pray and know how to touch the throne of God and are able to petition God in a way that those that only pray occasionally do not have the power to do. And so those that operate in the gifts and those that are working in the gifts are able to do things in the gifts that those that never really do that. And so it is a building, a maturing. That's what it's meant to do for you, to make you able to become more mature, stronger in your faith. If, if you're operating in the gifts, your faith grows. Your trust in God grows. Your belief in God, your, your understanding that God can do certain things because of your experience. See, that's what, what spiritual gifts do, is they give you experience. That's true in any part of your life. You, the first day you walked into the classroom, Sister Kristen, you were probably a nervous wreck. Standing in front of 30 kids for the very first time as Mrs. Perkins. Wasn't probably the funnest day of your life. But now you have experience, and so walking in front of 30 kids is just a breeze. So when we get experience, we are more confident in the Spirit. We're more confident in things, okay? And that's what it's meant to do. But it is also meant to edify the church as well. We understand that the church is made up of individuals, but there is a corporate power that is not accessible in individual power. Uh -huh. Let me say that again. We know that the church is made up of individuals, but as a corporate, we are more powerful than we ever will be as individuals. Paul, in in the Corinthians letter, he makes it very clear that the corporate body is meant to be built up. If this is true, then there is a power of togetherness that is not found in the power of separation. There is a power of being in the body of Christ that cannot be found in the power of being on your own. That, my friend, is why you've got to have the church. Edification comes from the individuals 
in the church. The way you are built up is by the workings of the Spirit through the lives of others that are in the church. Without gathering together corporately, you cannot be edified or built up or strengthened. You can't be. There is only an edification that comes in the church. I'm not saying that God can't build you up and edify you on your own. I can't, I'm not telling you that you can't grow a little bit, but there is a power and there is an authority and there is a strength that comes in the corporate body that will never be found individually. The people of the church build up the people of the church. And in doing so, there is a power attainable to the body as a whole. That power is greater than the power of the individual. The more gifts that are in operation, the greater the diversity and the greater the power, strength, and edification of the church as a whole. It is so much greater. When we are are corporately gathered together and all of those gifts are working, You have to understand that we gain a power as a unit. Mitchell, when you're in the the military and and you're out in the field and you walk out there as a bunch of greenhorns, now you've got training and you've got a lot of things that you went through. But that that group that first walked out into the field as a group, now you, you could have sharpshooters and you could have guys that are really good individually as they do, but... If they spend time together, working together, fighting together, are they more powerful than if you just set them aside and let them go on their own out to do the job? Absolutely. Why? Because if you go out on your own and you just say, go get them, guys, and and they just run amok out there shooting, and number one, you can shoot your buddy. You could. Number two, you got nobody covering your back. And so that's so true of the church. There there is so much more power in the group. I'm not taking away the power of the individual, but I'm saying as we gather together, corporately, the power is manifold. It's manifold. You got to have the church. You got to have the church. You've got to have the church. Ne- the, the, the word of God or the working of the spirit is never contrary to sound gospel. Never contrary, never contrary, never contrary to sound gospel. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it says, wherefore, I give to you understanding that no man speaking by the spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, Uh and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. You see, the operation of the gifts of the Spirit will never violate the Word of God, never. It will never violate the Word of God. It will never say or do something that is contrary to sound doctrine. The, the, The Spirit of God will never tell you, don't go to church. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many people have come up with that Absolutely. reason why they won't go to church. Well, I just, God just told me not to go. I don't believe that. No, that's not the way it works. Now, God may tell you not to go to a certain church. Okay, I, I'll give you that. But to don't go corporately and gather. That, that's, that's not what the Spirit's going to do. Now, you can do that of your own carnal mind. But that's not what the Spirit's going to do because it won't go contrary to the Word of God. The gifts of the Spirit will never be used in carnality. They are not for show. They are not for show. The operation of spiritual gifts are not meant to prove to everybody how spiritual you are. That's not what they're about. Look, my friend. You do not give the Holy Ghost by the laying on of your hands. It don't work that way. No, my friend. If that were so, dear Lord, I would go through Safeway. I would go through Fred Myers. I mean, I I would look out Mendenhall's in the hospital. Here we go. 
It, it don't work that way, okay? People have to receive the Holy Ghost. It's their will to receive. Hungry people reaching out to God. And so because you pray for them or I pray for them, it, it isn't that, you know, evangelist comes in and I preached and I... A revival and 37 people got the Holy Ghost the first night. No, you didn't do that. No, the gifts of the Spirit are not for our show. They're not for us to have a number of. They are for the glory of God. They're for the edifying of the church, to build the church up. So they're, they're, not, they're not for that. Where was my... There we go. Everything is to be done in the Spirit is to be done by the Spirit and not by the will of man. It's to be done as God moves. Each gift is for a specific purpose and to be used at specific times. That's what the gifts are for. They, they, are, they are used in a specific purpose at a specific time. The gifts of the Spirit will always flow and work in harmony with the service. You won't have stuff just popping up and happen out of the middle of nowhere. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry, but if I am preaching, the Word of God will not come to you and you've got to get up and give a, a prophecy or a testimony. It's not going to work that way. Okay? On a very rare occasion, I, I, very rare occasion I have seen in the midst of preaching that the Spirit of God moved without a doubt, and somebody gave a tongue. and I, that, That's fine. But God is not the author of confusion. And if all we have is this randomness that is going on, no, it works in the flow of the Spirit. It, it's in the harmony of the service. There are several gifts mentioned by Paul, but I, I, I'm not going to go in great detail tonight about each of these gifts. But the fact that he identifies them differently and individually show that each gift has a different characteristic and a different use. He, he, he doesn't just, just say there are gifts, it, but he identifies them. And by identifying means that there's something different about this one that is different about that one that is different about the other. And, but they're all meant, every one of them, to help us. Being different or being that they are different, there are, they are used at different times as well. Not every service will have every gift in operation. There are times that some gifts are going to be used and others are not going to be used. The reason is that it's all under the will of God. Everything's under the will of God. And it's not... And because... God wants to use certain gifts at a certain time. It's because he sees certain things that need to be done. And so he uses that gift at that time. It may not be appropriate at the time, or it may not be useful in the church for a certain gift to be used. Okay? This is the building of a church. It's like the building of a house. Okay? There are many tools when you build a house. Many, many tools. But when you're, when you're in the midst of framing a house up, you need hammers, you need nails, you need saws. You don't bring out the sheetrock mud. You don't bring out the, the, the sheetrock screws. You, you, know, you don't use those tools yet. There are tools that you use at certain times. They're meant to do specific things at that specific time. You use a level to make sure that the wall is straight and, 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 and not leaning. You, you, you use a tape measure. You, there's, there's tools that you're using in the building of the house. It's all meant that the house would be fully built. And all of those tools get used in the building of the house, but they're used at specific times for specific jobs to do a specific thing. It's the same with the Spirit of God. It's the same with the gifts of the Spirit. And there are times that different gifts will be used at different times. And they're meant for that time. That's the way the gifts work. Everything is done under the direction of the Spirit. The Spirit understands where we are in the church. We may think, well, we're right here, God. And God says, 
Oh, no, you, you're not ready for the sheetrock yet, buddy. We're still digging foundations. <laughs> we, we're still in the middle. Uh, you need an excavator to dig around a little bit. We, we don't need hammers yet. You know, everything's done under the direction of God. All the gifts are coming from the same source and used correctly to build the church. And as the church is built, it gains authority, it gains power, and it gains faith. Everything is under the power of the... This is the next thing. Everything that is done in the Spirit is done under the power of the person operating in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. It says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God moves on the person, but that person has control as the spirit is moving on them. They have control of everything that is going on. You have the power to stop the move of the Holy Ghost on you. You can feel the power of God moving on you, and it's ready, and you can just shut it right up. You can just shut it right off. You can say, nope, not going to happen. You can close your spirit, and you can resist the move. You can refuse to give the tongues. You can refuse to give the interpretation. You can refuse to use a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or a gift of healing. So, we're in the middle of, what were we doing? Um, we were praying. And I, I believe we were praying before service started. We were just, we had finished song service and we were praying. We were upstairs. And God spoke to me and he said, get the anointing oil and go pray for Kristen. Now, I didn't hear an audible voice. I felt an impression very strongly that told me, Get the anointing oil and go tell Kristen, or go pray for Kristen. I told God no. I did. You think that's... I did. I remember standing there thinking, well, that would be really weird. I mean, Kristen didn't ask for prayer. Kristen wasn't needing... She was over there with her hands raised just praying, okay? That's, it, it was just... Just normal stuff going on. So I just pretty much said, yeah, just not right now, God. Maybe, maybe altar time. We'll, we'll do it at altar. God, we're, we're, you know, there's a time here, God. <laughs> <laughs> I want to use the hammer, God. God says, no, you, you've got a foundation to dig. Yeah. So I, I said no. And, uh, and, and I stood there for another short second, one, one, one or two seconds, and I felt God say, I said, get the oil and go pray for Kristen. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I grabbed the oil. I went over. I think I scared her when I <laughs> touched her. <laughs> I just put my hand on her and I just prayed over her. But that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You can feel the unction of the Holy Ghost to do something. Yeah. You can feel... The, that God is moving on you in a certain way. And you have the ability to say, I'm not going to do that. You do. You have the ability to say, I, I, I just don't think I'm going to do that. Now, I have, I have felt it in this church. I have felt the power of God move. Now, we have tongues and interpretation, okay? And we're very, we're very um, accustomed to that now. It's not anything that weirds us out or freaks us out. It's, it's something that when it happens, it's normal. Sure. And we know how it happens. We know the way that that works. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are certain individuals that operate in that. Okay? Jonathan will give a tongue. My wife has given tongues. There's a few of you that have given tongues before. Mm -hmm. But I've been the only one that has interpreted. Okay? God has used me in that before, before I ever got here. And I will get into that. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But what I'm saying is, I have been in a service, the tongue was given, and I waited. And I felt God say, not you. I said, all right, God, somebody else. And it didn't happen. 
It didn't happen. So what I'm saying is there are, we have the ability to say, as God moves on us, I don't want to do that. You do. You have that ability. The, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophet. Okay? So, now, look, I, I'm, I'm just telling you that what we're working with is something that is very uncomfortable. It really is. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to say this later on, but I'm just going to tell you that to operate in the gift of tongues is... is how do I say this correctly? Uh, is something that we would be willing to do but to operate in the gift of interpretation my friend is something very few people are willing to do so you have to be willing to do it and 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 it and i will talk about it later but it's the same with praying or word of knowledge or word of wisdom sometimes god says to you go say to them go tell brother so-and-so go tell sister so-and-so and we're like God, I don't want to say that. I had one of the saints here tell me, he said, God told me to say this to so-and-so, and I really don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Did God tell you to say it, really, honestly? You're not making it up. You really feel God told you to say that? Yeah. What are you telling me? Go tell them. You see, that's what I'm talking about. And so we have to realize that's normal. That's normal, as long as it operates under the unctioning of God. Okay? I lost my notes here. That's how the Spirit leads in spiritual gifts. You have to feel a clear direction from God to do something. It's not a decision that you make. It's not, it's not something that you think, well, they need to know this. Okay? Now, let me back up on that. It's okay to come up to somebody and say, you know, I, I, I think you're going through this and I want to help you. That's fine. It's a whole different thing to come up and say, now God told me to tell you. When God didn't tell you, to yeah, tell them, yeah. okay? Yeah. If, you want, if you want to talk to somebody about something to help them, that's fine. Do that. That's brotherly care and kindness. But don't come up to somebody and say, you know, God told me to tell you. When God didn't tell you, to tell them, Okay? God will tell you to say something to, to people. God will give you an unctioning, okay? That's normal. But I'm just saying it's got to be a clear direction from God. If there is a doubt, don't do it. If there's a doubt in you, not a fear, okay? Two different things. If there is a, I know God is moving on me to give a tongue, and I'm just afraid to do it do it but if it's i'd like to give a tongue i think maybe i've got a little inspiration to give a tongue no my friend don't do that don't do that it doesn't work that way and i'll get into why later god is that's where the spirit of the prophet being subject to the prophet comes in if you know God is unctioning and leading and directing, then you need to do what you're being led to do. Is this making sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't resist that spirit. Don't resist that. If God is leading you and unctioning you to do it, don't resist that. Do it. God is not going to take over your being. God doesn't work like that. He's not going to go up to Ariel, and he's not going to just take Ariel and just grab her and cause her to go over and grab her arm and lay hands on somebody and start prophesying over them. He, he won't do that. He doesn't do it that way. He gives you an unctioning. You're completely in control of your body, of your mind. You're in control of everything until you release that control to him. And even then, you are conscious of everything that is going on. You're very conscious of it. When we operate out of control, we operate out of order. We fall into the trap of the Corinthian church, and we make mistakes that they did where we're more harmful than we are good. No. That's not what we want to do. No. And so Paul wrote to them, and Paul didn't tell them, knock it off, enough with the spiritual gifts. No. 
You guys stop those spiritual gifts. You don't know how to use them, just come on, give them to me. Give me, give me, all, those, give me all the spiritual gifts back. You guys ain't got it together. You don't know how to do it. Just give them back, all right? Till you learn, you grow up a little bit, then maybe we'll give you the squirt gun. We'll give you the, you know, you're going to put somebody's eye out with that thing. That's, that's not how he, he, he didn't tell them to stop. He said, look, you're doing it, but you're not doing it right. Let me show you how. Let me teach you how, okay? He didn't tell them to stop. He told them to do it right. Do it right. Because when you get it right, the operation of the Spirit impacts the church greatly. When you get it right, the impact of the operation of the Spirit on you and I helps us to grow and builds us up. The end result is that the corporate body becomes a very powerful force. The end result is that we tear down the strongholds of hell. The end result is that we overcome the kingdom of hell. The end result is that we will be the body of Christ on this earth that is doing healings, that is delivering, that is bringing words of wisdom, words of knowledge, that is prophesying. The end result is that God is exalted in his church and that people come to realize that there is a real God and that real God does real things among his people. That this ain't no dead, dull, dry religion that we are a part of. The end result is that people come in to the power of God, that people experience the presence of God. And that's exactly what Paul told the Corinthian church. He said, when this thing is done right and people come into your house and they walk in the door and they hear the power of God and they feel the power of God, they will surely say that God is among his people. And when it's done right, my friend, it's the most powerful thing. It is the greatest thing. It is the strongest thing. It is normal in the church. It's normal in the church. Can we stand tonight? Let's just gather around the, the front here for a while. This is normal, and we have to understand that. This is something that will be in operation in our church. This is something that will be a part of our every church service. It is something that we expect. It is something that will come to pass. Because you have to understand something about this church. This church was founded, founded on the gifts of the Spirit. What are you talking about, Brother Mendenhall? I'm here to tell you that the only reason this church exists today is because somebody operated under the gifts of the Spirit. I was back in the back, nowhere, because of the times. I was so far back, you had to have a pair of uh, binoculars to even spot me out in the middle of a sea of people. And one man, one man heard God say, go and pray for the person that I'll show you. He didn't know me, had no idea who I was. And he began to walk out among the people and he just started going down the aisle. And God said, right there, that one. And I didn't see him but I felt his hand as he put his arm around my neck and around my wife, and he, and he pulled us into it. Brother Howell operated under the gifts of the Spirit. He operated under a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge, and he operated in the gift of prophecy as, as God directed him directly to my wife and I. And it's because of the gifts of the Spirit that this church is in operation today. Because one man yielded to what God told him to do. He could have said, oh God, there's so many people out there. Lord, I, I, I would be out of order to go out there. I would be out of order to do that. But you know, you understand the importance of the gifts of the Spirit, how much it impacts people and how powerful it is to change lives. Because your life is changed today. 
I'm, I'm hoping that what has transpired in this church has made you to grow, has made you to become a stronger Christian, and that you are greater in your walk with God this year than you were last year. If that is true in your life, then you have to understand the reason of that is because an operation of the gift of the Spirit happened in my life, and it's happening in yours. The gifts are in operation in here. We just need to understand better what God is wanting to do in this church. I want to take down from you, out of you, away from you, the fear. I want that to come out of you. I want you to be open and I want you to seek it. Because the Apostle Paul said to seek after these things, to seek them, to look for them, to desire them, desire them. We, we have got to be a church that says, God, whatever you want to do in my life, however you want to use me, I want to be used to build this church. I want to be used that this church would be edified and stronger than it is right now. There is a power that is in this church. There is a power that is here. When we pray before church, there is a power that is there. When we begin to corporately, we gather together and we begin to pray, there is a power that is there. But we haven't begun to touch and scratch the surface of the power that God has for us. And that's what I want to happen. And I have been stirred about this and I, I have seen things in the spirit and it's like God wants to do things here. God wants to work in ways here. I want you, all of you, to understand that's normal. God has moved on you individually. God has moved in your heart and on your life. And God is wanting to move through you. I want you to understand that that's normal. We've got to yield to it. We've got to allow the spirit to move. It's a learning process. I want to say this in the very beginning of this message, okay? I want you to understand this. You will make mistakes, okay? That happens. I have made mistakes in the spirit. I, I, have, I have made mistakes because I felt a certain thing and I was wrong about it, okay? You're going to learn, okay? I built three houses, and I've learned something in building every one of them. You're in the process of learning. Nobody expects you to be perfect. I'll explain this later, okay? I'll make this a little bit more clear. Because we all come in this thinking that because God is moving through me, it's going to be perfect. God is perfect. What he does is perfect. His will is perfect. But he's working through imperfect people. And we make mistakes sometimes in how we're doing something or what we're trying to do, okay? Nobody is going to condemn anybody in this church. Correct? Maybe. Condemn not. If our heart is right, our desire and our focus is good, God's going to work. God's going to work. It's for you. I want you to lose all the fear. And I want you to open your heart. And I want you to open your spirit. And I want you just to be willing to let God move in you. Can we just raise our hands right now?